Whoa, that autofocus. Please, me. me. We're trying autofocus this time because my girlfriend's out of town and she's uh, has been the one that has uh, uh, got the focus right on the camera. Anyway, hey, it's Halloween officially now. Uh, so today I want to talk about hereditary. Um, and let me set the scene a little bit. It's June 2018, and I'm 17. The up-and-coming film distributor, A24, is starting to really make a name for itself. Last year, in 2017, uh, they started to gain a reputation as a solid source for indie film, releasing Sean Baker's The Florida Project, The Safdie Brothers' Good Time, and Greta Gerwig's uh, Lady Bird, all in the same year. Uh, importantly, all of those movies that I just mentioned uh, were by smaller directors who've since gone on to cement themselves as mainstays in the air quotes indie movie scene. I say air quotes because uh, it, that's a term people get pretty anal about, and also because the market that A24 is currently in the process of cornering is a pretty specific one. While mainstream Hollywood is continuing to abandon the mid-budget picture in favor of $100 million plus behemoths, A24 is focusing on low, but not micro-budget films. And that's actually pretty cool. Uh, the unique thing about A24 is that their modest budgets have allowed them to invest in some new and interesting projects that deviate considerably from the Hollywood canon. Despite the love-hate relationship that some people have fostered with the indie distributor, um, it can't be denied that they've offered a lot of variety in the post-MCU movie landscape. Suffice it to say, uh, by 17, I had learned that when the A24 production theme played before a movie trailer, uh, it was worth paying attention to. And I would gotten myself a ticket to see their newest outing, a horror movie called Hereditary. And I was pretty excited to see what this Ari Aster guy had to offer. And so I went and saw it, and I loved it. I thought it was incredible for every reason that everyone thinks it's incredible. The beyond bleak atmosphere, the decisive and unique cinematic vision, the all-around stellar performances, particularly from Tony Collette. And everyone I talked to about it felt the same, for the most part. You see, despite the sea of praise for this movie, one criticism kept rising to the top. One little caveat to the unanimous endorsement of this film. And it went a little something like this. The third act was kinda weird. To start off, I'd like to say that this video is sort of a loose response uh, to one made by the creator Meep Top. Uh, the video is titled, Hereditary and Midsummer Are Fatally Flawed. I think his video is a really well-articulated example of the sentiment that I want to explore throughout this video. Although I ultimately disagree with his take on this particular movie, I admire his work a lot, especially as an aspiring movie, video, essay, content man myself. Oh, and also, I'm making this video assuming that you've seen Hereditary. Um, if you haven't, don't sit here watching me talk about it. Do yourself a favor and uh, go check it out, because it's a wild ride. I wanted to quickly establish uh, why I think some people don't exactly love the third act of Hereditary. And I'm going to use Meep Top's video as an example. The film forces you to dwell in its themes of inherited grief, trauma, and mental illness. It is thought-provoking. It is uncomfortable. The performances are excellent, especially from Tony Collette. The soundtrack is absolutely gorgeous. Ari Aster executes every scene with the technical precision of a master craftsman. The film just continues ramping up with intensity as you feel the impending dread 
of a sinister conclusion, and then it turns out it was just say I mean, Payman the entire time. I think this clip is a pretty good example of the general argument against Hereditary's third act. Uh, something along the lines of this. The film begins as a brutally realistic portrayal of grief and inherited mental illness, with slight occult undertones. Then, the film ends in the kind of over-the-top demonic bloodbath that you might expect from something in the Conjuring cinematic universe. Who's ever down there, I'm gonna lock you in now! And that tonal switch-up is admittedly pretty sudden. Basically, we go from no explicit supernatural phenomenon for the first hour or so of the movie, uh, and then Tony Collette has a couple weird experiences with seances, and then, out of nowhere, in the last 20 minutes or so, uh, this guy inexplicably immolates, and Tony Collette becomes a murderous, floating, super-strength-having demon lady. I think this is definitely part of the argument against uh, Hereditary's third act, uh, but I don't think people dislike it just because the tonal shift is jarring. I think what really ruffles some feathers about the last chunk of Hereditary is the feeling that the dark, grounded themes of the film are abandoned in lieu of this batshit crazy, exorcist-style ending. As Meep Top puts it, the rest of the film is extremely daring in its themes and execution, but by the end you realize you just got tricked into watching the art house version of a paranormal activity movie. He goes on after this to say that he thinks the occult themes were well handled, but that they ultimately cut the legs out from under the film. And I, I feel like that's the crux of a lot of people's qualms with the end of Hereditary. In light of the film's depressive, unflinchingly grounded first two acts, the over-the-top extremeness of its ending comes off as a bit cheap. When this soul-crushing study of a family rapidly falling apart suddenly explodes into a more traditional horror movie ending, it's understandable that some people feel that those initial, more depressive and grounded themes are effectively abandoned and left unresolved. But I totally disagree with that, because... So, I'll explain what this means a little better. Um, stuff can be two things is actually a line I stole from a friend of mine. I don't remember exactly what the context was, uh, but I couldn't stop thinking about it while I was watching Meep Top's video. Specifically, I think about that statement when Meep Top implies that the ending of Hereditary is a bit of a cop-out on Ari Aster's part. It feels like Ari Aster wanted to make a moving, terrifying film about heavy themes, but then it scared him so much he decided, eh, fuck it. Don't be scared, it was just Satan the whole time, like we were watching Scooby-Doo. And what I mean by stuff can be two things in this instance is that I don't think we ultimately need to ask the question, is the movie about mental health or is it about the demonic possession of a family? Because it can be and is about both. And I think when we start reading the film as an interplay between realistic internal conflict and supernatural occult conflict, rather than a battle between the two, it allows the film's ending to serve as a cataclysmic culmination of both elements at once. When asked if the movie was really about mental illness, or if the family just thinks they're mentally ill because they're being preyed on by demonic forces, Astor responds, The film straddles both sides, right? I wanted it to function as a serious meditation on grief and trauma and the difficulties of navigating loss. There are clearly references made in the text to mental illness, and there's meant to be some ambiguity whether the film is about a family following each other into madness, or whether it's, you know. Now despite all this, 
I could still understand being unhappy with the film's ending uh, if those disparate themes of demonic possession versus mental illness did not effectively coexist within the text. If the ending and its deep dive into the occult were truly disjointed from the rest of the film, uh, then it would feel tacked on and unoriginal. But I think Astor does a good job of pulling these two aspects of the film together. I mean, I think the film's third act is jarring, sure, but I don't think it's at all unprecedented. And the specific way the film lays that emotional and narrative groundwork for its ending keeps the third act from feeling at all like the disjointed, phoned-in cop-out that it's sometimes accused of being. I think to effectively establish that Hereditary's third act works, it's necessary to refute the idea that it comes out of nowhere, because it really doesn't. But as I established earlier, I think the real problem people have with this ending is more of a feeling of thematic dissonance. So I'd like to respond to that with some evidence of the film's different themes playing off of each other in the final act rather than the more supernatural themes simply overshadowing the more gritty, interpersonal ones. And I think the best example of my point uh, comes in the film's exploration of the relationship between Peter and Annie. Peter is Annie's firstborn child. During one of the film's grief support group scenes, Annie reveals that she kept him away from her mother, who she clearly believed to be a malignant influence on her life. She juxtaposes this with Charlie, her second child. Annie explains that she let her mother back into her life when she had Charlie, and that her mother immediately stabbed her hooks into the child. We see an unnerving intermingling of love and hatred in Annie and Peter's relationship. In a particularly disturbing dream sequence, we see Annie confess to Peter that she didn't want to have him, that she was fearful of having a child, but was ultimately pressured into it by her mother. She goes on to explain that she tried to have a miscarriage. The dream culminates in Annie and Peter both inexplicably soaked in lighter fluid. In this moment, they are both sobbing. Peter is repeatedly accusing Annie of trying to kill him, and Annie is insisting that she was only trying to save him presumably from the malignant influence of her mother. Then, Annie is suddenly holding a lit match, and both go up in flames. And we learn that this dream is actually based on a real occurrence in their relationship, in which Annie, while sleepwalking, doused herself and her son in lighter fluid, and woke up just before tossing a lit match on the both of them. It's a moment that clearly clouds both of their perceptions of each other. Peter is cursed with the knowledge that his mother unintentionally almost killed him in a gruesome murder-suicide. And Annie is also afraid of herself, afraid of what she's capable of when not conscious of her actions. Despite loving Peter, uh, she's fearful of her subconscious urges to commit violence against him. And in another layer in their complex relationship, the film leads us to believe that uh, these subconscious urges against Peter uh, are a product of Annie's desire to spare him entirely from the malignant force that is his grandmother, of the inherent malignance of their family tree. But Peter, being young and not knowing the full story, uh, is unable to see things this way. And how can we blame him, especially now that he bears the weight of his sister's death? All Peter sees is a mother that, at best, resents him, and, at worst, wants to hurt him. When we keep this aspect of the film in mind, the third act becomes more haunting, as it mainly consists of a demonically possessed Annie viciously preying upon Peter. By this point, Charlie has been dead for a while, and Steve, Peter's father, and his only real beacon of stability is laying in front of the fireplace, burned alive. It's only Annie and Peter. And again, she is doing to him what they both fear the most. 
she, in a totally unconscious state, is trying to kill him. At one point in the last act, Peter attempts to seek safety in the attic. With the trap door to the attic closed, Annie violently slams her head into it repeatedly. Peter, sobbing uncontrollably in the room above, repeatedly apologizes to his mother. This moment in particular tells us something that makes the scene all the more gut-wrenching. And that's that Peter doesn't realize that the entity on the floor below is not his mother anymore. He woke up in the middle of all of this, and in the chaos of it all, his instinct is to try to apologize to her, to calm her down. Tragically, Peter believes that this is some sort of mental break on his mother's part, and that her resentment has won over, and that she's now coming to kill him. Another example of the film bringing its different themes together comes shortly after. In a fit of panic, Peter jumps out the attic window and dies falling to the ground below. And then we watch his body float up into Charlie's treehouse. Inside, the structure has been completely transformed into an altar to the demon god Paimon. Joan is kneeling in the middle of the room, surrounded by nude corpses and other cultists. Peter, now evidently possessed by Charlie, stands in the center of the room, looking confused and scared at the gruesome scene. Joan stands, places a crown on Peter slash Charlie slash Payman's head, and says in a comforting tone, Charlie, you're all right now. You are Payman, one of the eight kings of hell. Joan goes on to tell Peter slash Charlie slash Payman that they've summoned him here, and that they swear fealty to him. Then she apologizes for initially giving him a suboptimal host body. That suboptimal host body being Charlie's body. And here again is a moment that might make some people feel like the film has abandoned its more grounded themes. That it's shoehorned in some ill-defined supernatural entity in place of a real ending. But I think, to the contrary, that this moment recontextualizes our understanding of Charlie, and by extension Annie, in a really significant way. Yeah, I, I'm kind of a degenerate for drinking White Claw, but they were, it was a six pack for like $11. I don't know, I'm drinking alone watch, look, talking to a camera. Ugh. Anyway, that line, uh, Charlie, you are payman, implies that there's never really been a unique Charlie. Charlie was always inextricably tied to this demon king Payman, who has simply been raised as a young girl and has learned to identify as Charlie. Her entire life existed as nothing more than a vessel for a demon king. Her death was an orchestrated event meant to rid Payman of this non-ideal host so that he could eventually possess his ideal host, Peter. And this revelation becomes all the more painful when we remember Annie describing her relationship with her mother, especially as it pertained to Charlie. When Charlie was born, Annie had just let her mother back into her life, and as Annie described, she immediately sunk her hooks into Charlie. In this moment, we're told that Charlie, and by extension this whole family, were doomed from the moment Annie let her mother back into her life. Despite desperately trying to do the right thing, despite attempting to navigate the twisted mess of her relationship with her mother, despite her attempts to cut off the malevolent vines of her family tree before they strangled her children, Annie ultimately fails. Her children's lives were damned from the beginning. They were nothing more than tools in their grandmother's twisted games. Annie's life and the lives of her children are hopelessly infested by this infernal, demented force. And does it really matter if we call that force demons, or hereditary mental illness, or generational trauma?
So yeah, ultimately, I think that's why Hereditary's ending is perfect as is. Because yes, the story does end with the literal inclusion of demons. And pacing-wise, it does deviate from the slow character study groove that the first two acts establish. But those decisions are ultimately really well executed. And I don't think the ending forgets about the rest of the film either. In fact, I think Hereditary's ending builds upon the film's more character-centric themes in a way that is incredibly moving. And to the accusation that the movie's ending is unoriginal, I think that yeah, at first glance, uh, the ending looks like something that's been done before. But Hereditary's ending, because of the lead-up, uh, is way more weighty than your average horror movie. I mean, these aren't the kind of one-dimensional demon fodder characters uh, that we would see in a Conjuring movie. As Hereditary's detractors make clear, these are characters that the film has just spent an hour and a half deconstructing for the audience. We know the depths of their trauma. We know just how strained their familial bonds are. And we know their deepest, most primitive fears. This is a film about mental illness and loss and trauma in a family. And in the end, what we see is that emotional baggage fully engulf them. And I think that's why I love it so much. So this is a little less terrifying. Maybe that's more terrifying. Um, hey! Uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, I spent a lot of time cutting the jack-o'-lantern um, and also setting this light up in the floor. Uh, and I'm home alone, so actually sitting uh, in this lighting was kind of terrifying. Um, so if you liked the video, uh, please like and subscribe if you want to. I don't like saying shit like that. Um, it makes me feel uh, so incredibly strange. Uh, but I would appreciate it, because maybe I'll see that you liked the video, and then I'll think, hey, people liked that video that I uh, spent a lot of time uh, uh, filming and writing and editing um, for uh, no money. So thank you so much for watching, and bye.